Hello everyone, this is going to be 2.2. Uh, uh, we're going to continue looking at the British colonies. Now, for here, we are going to start with a quote from uh, a very important speech given, and we're going to look at this one in class a little bit more. It's by a guy named John Winthrop, who gave it on a ship called the Arabella on his way over to Massachusetts. It's from a larger uh, homily that he gave called A Model of Christian Charity in 1630. Uh, and he said, For we must consider that we shall be a city upon a hill. Bible reference. Uh, the eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. So sort of setting up Boston to be the pinnacle of what a good colony should look like to the rest of the world. Now, let's look at New England. New England colonies arose in a very different manner than the Chesapeake. Uh, they were looking for different things, kind of. The, uh, the colonies are founded primarily around religion and a belief in what is called Puritanism. So what is a Puritan? A Puritan, by the way, Puritan was originally an insult term. It was meant to be sort of making fun of them, like, oh, they're so pure, uh, was <clears throat> they were Protestants who were not satisfied with uh, they thought that Henry VIII had not gone far enough in uh, the Protestant Reformation in England. In fact, they thought that uh, the uh, Anglican services were still very too Catholic. They were too sort of big into the costumes and the drama and the theatrics of it all. Uh, they wanted to uh, tone it down. They thought that uh, Puritanism or that, that the Church of England should be very, you know, sort of serious and strict. Uh, they rejected the Anglican bishops. They believed that only local congregations should choose their clergymen, not the, uh, not the bishops and certainly not the king. Um, this, by the way, the local congregations is why sometimes these Puritans are also called congregationalists. They also considered themselves, while members of the Church of England, uh, they did feel that they wanted to purify it and make it better. So uh, Puritans, at least at first, were still part of the Church of England. So here is what a congregational church used to look like. Now this is the Grandel Theater in St. Louis, Missouri, but it started as a congregational church. Now, spiritual life for the Puritans is a lot more hard work. Uh, you don't just recite prayers. You don't just sit there in church and do five Our Fathers, and then you, you call it a week. Uh, you had to passionately seek out the truth on your own, uh, and you had to prove it constantly, uh, and it was a hard thing to do. Uh, sermons were long, hours long, and you sat there and you listened, sitting ramrod straight in your chair so uh, to prove that you were still paying attention. Um, these are not the 10-minute, you know, love each other and then go out and do good sort of lessons. These are... These are long. Um, they followed the beliefs of a Swiss Protestant by the name of John Calvin. Uh, Calvin believed in what is called predestination, that God had already chosen everybody who was going to be saved at the end of the world and everyone who was going to go to hell at the end of the world. And so you had better hope that you are among the chosen. However, even if you're chosen, it doesn't mean that you can just live the free and easy. You have to live a very moral life on earth. Um, as it could be seen as an indication that you are one of God's chosen. Now, Puritanism was more than just, you know, going to church on Sundays. Uh, like I said, you had to passionately live out this belief. It was zealous, a belief in your rightness and also that everyone else was wrong, and not just wrong, but morally wrong, and that's a dubious thing, the dangerous thing sometimes. Some Puritans believed so strongly in their faith that they decided they would separate completely from the Anglican Church. They believed that it was beyond saving, basically. The Anglican Church had not moved far enough away from Catholicism. It was doomed to failure. Uh, and so these guys who wanted to separate became known as the separatists. So you have Puritans and you have separatists. Um, and they formed, the separatists formed Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. And this conviction made them very unpopular. So think about it this way. Uh, first of all, they are 
saying no to the Church of England, and the king is the head of that church, and also they're not making friends with the Puritans either. Uh, and so a lot of these guys are just persona non grata. They are not very welcome wherever they go in England. So a lot of them actually got out of England and headed to the Netherlands, which was a lot more uh, religiously open. Uh, and eventually they fled back to England and then back to America, hoping to create this city upon a hill that we talked about uh, in the opening. We'll talk about it more in class, like I said. So if we're talking about liberty for the Puritans, uh, this was not necessarily, you know, what we learned in grade school, which is why did the, the Puritans come over here? Well, they were looking for religious freedom. That's kind of true. They were looking for the religious freedom to worship as they saw fit. However, it did not mean that they were interested in allowing other people to worship as they saw as as they saw fit. Um, and so um, they wanted to live in a manner that was morally upright, spiritually serious. Um, they wanted self-government, but it, they did not want other religions coming over. Uh, the colony's first governor, John Winthrop, who gave that city upon a hill speech, said that natural liberty was not part of the deal. Uh, which is the, uh, the whole idea of the freedom to do evil and live outside the blessings of God. That, you know, if you're going to live here, you're going to be a good citizen, basically, and a moral citizen. He believed in what was called moral liberty, which was you have the freedom to do that which is good. And this type of liberty was totally fine with, the re with restrictions on freedom of speech and freedom of religion and uh, restrictions on certain actions, and they enforced strict adherence to religious laws. So you were free, but don't think it was like a freedom to do whatever you wanted, basically. Here, by the way, is John Winthrop, 1587 to 1649, born in England. He was a lawyer and the uh, governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, and famous for that city upon a hill speech, which I keep babbling on about. Now, the pi pilgrims, who are just these Puritan travelers, pilgrims was almost another kind of cheap shot at them, uh, landed at uh, Plymouth Colony in 1620. They were actually aiming for Virginia, but they ended up in, in Massachusetts instead because of the wind blew them off course. Um, however, before leaving uh, the Mayflower, 41 of the men on board the Mayflower decided to sign what was called the Mayflower Compact. It was a set of rules, just and equal laws that all men would solve, uh, or all, all men would follow, I'm sorry, um, and uh, in order to create sort of a more peaceful land. Uh, this included men who normally wouldn't have a voice in, in government, uh, people who were sort of lower down the social ladder. Uh, this territory had been discovered about a century before, so this was not the first time that the British had settled uh, or had found uh, Massachusetts, but this was one of the first big settlements of British people. And English fishermen had actually been going up and down the coast for a while. Uh, they had been trading with the local natives, uh, and they also brought disease with them. So uh, they had actually depopulated the Native American tribe before uh, the uh, the newcomers settled in at Plymouth. So here is uh, the signing of the Mayflower Compact. This picture was painted in 1899. Now, they also arrived in the beginning of winter, which is not the world's best time to establish a farming colony, is right in the middle of winter. So half of them died in the first winter. So just like we see in Jamestown, these guys have passion, they have devotion, but they do not necessarily have the, the necessary skill set to survive. It's quite possible the entire colony would have perished if it wasn't for the help of a local tribe led by a man named Squanto. Squanto had actually been captured and enslaved by the Spanish and had made his way to England, learned English, and came back. Uh, and so Squanto sort of helped them learn how to survive in this area. The natives taught them how to fish, how to plant, how to grow things in pretty nasty soil, uh, helped them to make an, an alliance with a local chief named Massasoit. Uh, and so the Plymouth colony... Uh, allowed uh, even men who weren't part of the church to vote. This was very different. Uh, usually you had to be part of the, the, uh, the, the, the church sort of uh, hierarchy in order to vote, but they decided that uh, in this situation they would allow men even who weren't part of the church to vote. Um, and they set out to create a very strongly Christian colony, independent from other colonies. This is another thing is that uh, these colonies, 13 of them eventually, were not necessarily interested in creating one big happy family. So here is Squanto, by the way, sometimes known as Tisquantum, uh, about 1585 to about 1622. 
born in uh, what eventually became Massachusetts as a member of the Patuxet tribe. Uh, he was eventually sold as an enslaved person to Europe, learned English, and came home. Uh, he found his whole tribe dead when he came home of disease, so he actually moved in with the local other tribe known as the Wampanoag. Um, he acted as a translator and also a survival guide for the early uh, pilgrims. Here we see him bearing a fish. That's because if you want to plant stuff in, in ro rocky, sandy soil, putting a dead fish in sort of helps uh, get nutrients into the soil, basically. Now, the Plymouth Colony was very soon overshadowed by its big brother, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, right down the road. This colony came about in 1629, and they were founded by Puritan merchants in London. So these guys were a little bit less extreme than the Plymouth Colony. Um, and they also had the hope that they would further spread their religion, but also make money at the same time. They wanted to be both holy and successful. Uh, and over the next few years, about 21,000 Englishmen left for Massachusetts. This is known as the Great Migration. Uh, sadly, uh, historians are not clever. This is not the only time that we've named something the Great Migration, so get used to hearing that term. So here are the two colonies. We see uh, Plymouth Colony, and uh, Massachusetts Bay is actually up to the northwest up there. Uh, and so these are the two big colonies of the time. Now, these colonies were different than the Chesapeake colonies in the fact that most of the settlers were traveling in as families. It's not just a bunch of young, sort of wandering men. It's, it's entire families are coming over. Uh, and mainly they're coming over because they were not very welcome in England due to their religious beliefs. They also hoped, however, that they would be able to be an economic success story. Uh, many of the people traveling to the Northeast were a bit older, a bit more well-off, uh, and we have a bit more egalitarianism between men and women as well. Uh, they also tended to live longer and have more children um, because the, the, uh, the colder weather actually killed off a lot of the bugs that are causing the diseases in uh, the uh, Chesapeake area. <clears throat> now, uh, despite all of this, fewer people moved to Massachusetts probably because it was cold again uh, and hard, and also the Puritans were not overly welcoming. Um, so the New England colonies were very patriarchal. Women had very few, uh, had very little power in the Northeast. Women and children and servants were expected to be subordinate to the man of the house. Uh, they often used the Bible verse about God being the, you know, God is the head of the church much as man is the head of the house. And uh, this is a St. Paul to the Corinthians, I believe, uh, that, that sort of talks about this. And so that's what they used as sort of their... Uh, rationale for why women should not have the same power as men. Women were spiritually equal, uh, however, in the house they were not. Uh, however, this did mean that women were allowed to be full members of the church and could divorce as well, although it was not, uh, it was not looked upon well if you divorced. Now, being single was seen as, as wrong. You were supposed to stay married and get married. Women often married younger in uh, New England and had more children, sometimes seven or more. Um, now, you have to realize that the reason that women are having seven or more children is because 50% of them would die. And so you had to, if you wanted to have, you know, three healthy children, you probably had to have seven children total. Now, much of a woman's life is also dedicated to raising and caring for the children. This is sort of seen as the domain of the women in the uh, Puritan family household. This is a uh, painting of the Savage family from 1779. A whole bunch of them, and I don't know, there's something weird about the, their, their heads seem a little too big on the kids or something. I don't know. What am I, an artist? Uh, Puritans. We're not big on individualism. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. It's good for one, it's good for all. Or it's good for all, it should be good for all. Uh, unlike the big farms in Virginia, New Englanders were living in very small, uh, very well laid out cities and towns, and they didn't have these large, sprawling plantations. It was meant to be a bit more of, uh, you know, you're part of the community. Uh, and every town had a church by law, or by, you know, they, they set aside some land and some money for the church in every town. Uh, and the town also had to create a school. Now, this was not just because they wanted their kids well-educated. It was also because if you wanted to uh, make your kids, make sure that your kids read the Bible and get saved and go to heaven, you better have a school to teach them how to read the Bible. Harvard 
The first university in America, I'm sorry, the first British university in America, was founded in 1636 as a way to train preachers in the, Ang in, in the, uh, the, the Puritan belief system. Now, men in Massachusetts could also vote for their governor as long as they were church members, uh, and they had a lot more local power. Uh, however, becoming a member of the church is also very difficult to do, so it's kind of a, a, a club that's hard to get into. Here, by the way, is Harvard back in the day in 1636. Now, the New England colonies separated people by wealth. Uh, a sign of wealth was a sign of uh, how good you were and, and also how worthwhile you were. Um, the rich people ran the colony, and the poor were seen as beneath them. They were literally seen as the poor, poor them, uh, not just financially, but also just socially and morally. Uh, being a gentleman or lady was not a random thing, and it was not a title for everyone. Uh, I remember reading a story, and it basically said, you know, we put gentlemen and lady on our bathroom doors nowadays. But back then, not everybody was a gentleman, not everybody was a lady. And the rights of people in Massachusetts were also very different based upon your social standing. Uh, and at first, at least, slavery was allowed in Massachusetts. We will see it go away by about the time of the American Revolution, but it was still around, not on the level of the, the Chesapeake or the South, but it was there. The first record of slavery in Massachusetts is 1640. Now, church and state were also very deeply connected at this time. Um, ministers could not be elected officials. Um, however, the state also very strictly enforced religious devotion. You're not allowed to miss church. There was also a certain amount of freedom of speech. However, you could be executed for worshiping God incorrectly in the eyes of the people, or for practicing witchcraft Salem, or cursing out loud could also be considered a killable offense. Uh, there was only one religion allowed in the colony, and that was Puritanism. And if you dissented, if you said no, uh, you would be taking away your chance of success and also putting your life at risk as well. So here is, in 1659, three Quakers being executed in Boston for practicing the wrong religion in Boston. Now let's look at the division of New England as well. Uh, there was a lot of division during this time, especially in the social structure. Um, these New England colonies encouraged and even celebrated the idea of being sort of thinking for yourself uh, because partially they believed that the way to reach God was not necessarily just by listening to your pastor at all times. Uh, however, if you got a little too free thinking, they could punish you for it. Um, the strength and the happiness of the community was before all else, so the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Um, and citizens also would report on each other and keep an eye on each other. And people who acted weird or deviated from social norms, things like criticizing the church, complaining, uh, being burdensome, whatever that meant, uh, this could all get you in trouble, get you kicked out of the colony, if you're lucky. One guy who was kicked out of the colony was a guy named Roger Williams. Um, he left in about, it, it, this happened in about 1631. Williams was a Puritan minister in the Massachusetts colony. Uh, he advocated for strange ideas like freedom of religion. Um, he said that since men were allowed to follow their own moral codes, they should follow it wherever it took them, even out of religion uh, or out of the, the one religion. Um, and he also called for a separation of the church and the state, which was not a thing in Massachusetts at that time. Uh, and he was calling for, for straight up leaving the Church of England. Uh, Roger Williams also denied that Puritans were somehow the chosen people. Williams thought you could be chosen outside of it, too. So <clears throat> here's Roger Williams who say, God requireth not a uniformity of religion. So he believes that there's more than one path to salvation. Williams and his strange beliefs were banished from Massachusetts in 1636, and he moved south to a place called Rhode Island. Uh, in Rhode Island, he established a colony of religious toleration. Uh, there was no state religion in Rhode Island. You didn't have to go to church, and there was no religious qualification for voting. And so people who didn't belong to the established religions were allowed. These guys were called dissenters. They were even the first Jewish people allowed in America came to Rhode Island, which became sort of... They, they set, the, set the standard for religious freedom and democratic government and fierce independence, and they were very proud of it in Rhode Island. They are very proud of their independence, even up through today. 
uh, so much so that they put the statue of the independent man on top of their state house. Now, these are not the only colonies being uh, built at this time out of sort of dissenters. In 1636, Thomas Hooker, a minister, uh, started the colony of Hartford uh, with the rule that men uh, didn't have to be church members to vote. So he's another dissenter who went off. And Hartford eventually joins up with another called New Haven, which was founded in 1638, uh, New Haven went the other direction, trying to establish an even stronger combination of church and state, stronger than Massachusetts, so they wanted church and state to be married. Uh, eventually, these two would kind of get over their differences and become Connecticut in 1662. So here is Rhode Island, which I can never seem to find a good zoomed-in picture of, and here is Connecticut as well, to the left of Rhode Island. Now, another person who separated during this time, a separatist from the separatists, was Anne Hutchinson. Uh, Anne Hutchinson was a midwife, meaning that she uh, delivered children in Massachusetts. However, she also had some very um, new and dangerous ideas for that time period. She led her own religious meetings and had conversations in her home, and she attracted very wealthy and very influential men and women who were very impressed with how smart she was and how influential she was and how good she was at speaking. Eventually, Hutchinson announced, basically, and wrote that salvation was given by God to those who were considered the elect. Uh, you could not get into heaven through good works, good efforts. It was all about salvation through God alone. And she called out ministers for basically saying that church attendance could impact your sanctity, that you could... Uh, that the more you went to church, the holier, holier you were. Anne Hutchinson eventually got in a lot of trouble for this. She went on trial in 1637 uh, for what was called antinomianism, which is going against the teachings of the church. Uh, she defended herself quite well, even though it was a foregone conclusion that she was going to lose. Um, she went so far as to say that she received divine revelation. However, in the end, she and her followers were kicked out of Massachusetts. She went to Rhode Island for a while before eventually uh, moving to New York, where unfortunately she was, uh, she and her daughters were killed in a Native American attack. Eventually, uh, Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson both showed the limits of, like, personal liberty in Massachusetts, having ideas that are outside the norm uh, when it comes to things like religious beliefs and uh, also the danger of taking on the political establishment in Massachusetts. So here is a statue of Ann Hutchinson, Ironically, they put this statue up outside of the Massachusetts State House, so apparently they consider her back. Uh, they consider her a member of the Massachusetts uh, elite again now. And she said a Christian is not bound to the law. That's a dangerous thing to say right there, uh, for, especially back then when she was saying it. Now, these colonies also had a very complex, complicated, sort of controversial dealings with Native Americans. Um, there were many tribes in the Massachusetts area However, a lot of them moved inland after the uh, English arrived in Massachusetts. They're like, nope, we're moving in. Uh, so Roger Williams was one of the few who was actually calling for colonies to pay the natives for their land. Uh, he even also went so far as to learn how to speak their language. Uh, John Winthrop agreed to a certain amount um, as, long it was, as long as it was unused land. However, Roger Williams, again, was pretty iconoclastic when it came to dealing with Native Americans. Now, in the eyes of the Puritans, Native Americans were seen as savage in nature and savage in faith. Uh, they were basically uh, Catholics in their mind, you know, uh, heathens. They, they were people who, who were not following the true path. They were an example of why moral liberty was better than natural liberty in the minds of the Puritans. And eventually, New England colonies took steps to stop people from joining Native tribes or for uh, doing too much you know, trade or sort of becoming too infatuated with native tribes. Eventually, uh, they uh, called on uh, hard labor for anyone caught joining native tribes. Uh, and eventually, this sort of uh, also led to people writing these uh, stories about being captured by Native Americans and all the horrible things that they saw when they were captured. These became known as captivity narratives, first-hand accounts regarding what happened when they were kidnapped. They, uh, there were also plans made to convert natives in New England to the Puritan faith as well. Now, at first, many tribes sought to make some sort of connection with the arriving British people. 
However, as time went on, they came to sort of see them as, as interlopers, people moving into their land and, and taking it over without their consent. And so in 1637, an English fur trader was killed by members of the Pequot tribe, and this became known as what was called the Pequot War, where the, uh, the British settlers uh, retaliated against the Pequot tribe. Um, the Pequot War was fought against Massachusetts, Connecticut, and their native allies who were fighting against the Pequot. And the culmination of this was one night where the settlers surrounded the main Pequot village in Connecticut, I believe, and lit it on fire. And as people, uh, Native Americans, fled the, uh, the flames, they were shot as they left the town. And over 500 men, women, and children died that night. This is the destruction of that Pequot village in uh, uh, drawing. This defeat opened up huge pieces of land for New England, and some Puritans were pretty horrified by the deaths and the tactics by which the Pequots died. However, others saw it as a defeat of savagery, and others saw it basically as a way to get the land, and they're happy with the land. But uh, some saw it as the defeat of Satan in the New World. Now, while religion was playing a big part in the colonization of New England, money was also very important. Um, many Puritans were middle-class weavers, tailors, farmers, and they were able to pay for their passage on their own. They did not have to do the headright system. And they wanted not only religious freedom, but they also wanted economic independence at the same time, too. Um, so there were some people who did just want to move there. They, they were not as concerned with religion as they were for doing well and, and making a success of themselves. So the main exports in New England were fish, especially cod off the coast of Cape Cod, uh, and the tall trees uh, that were around New England used to build homes and build ships. Now, slavery and indentured servitude were allowed at this time. However, they were not the primary method of labor. They kind of went against that whole idea of, like, you know, being uh, an independent person, because if you're dependent on somebody else to do your work for you, it's not considered uh, the best visual. So here is an example of how much or how important cod was to uh, the uh, Massachusetts colonies. Uh, this is the sacred cod, which is a uh, wooden fish that's uh, sitting above uh, the floor of the Massachusetts State House. So in cod we trust, because get it, it's cod. Anyway, so let's talk about the merchant elite. While New England did not uh, make as much money as the Chesapeake did, because they're not uh, harvesting tobacco, um, it was a trade hub for uh, Europe and for Africa, so European and African ships did come there. They also traded a lot with the Caribbean during this time. Um, this wealthy class was seen as sort of uh, a little bit weird in the Puritan sense. You know, you're supposed to be living frugally and, and not, not having sort of big displays of your wealth. Uh, so this wealthy class was seen as sort of against the Puritan values of living simply. Uh, seeking out the freedom to trade, some colonists actually left for places like New Hampshire, which was also being developed about this time. The Puritan experiment eventually lost out to the Boston experiment of, you know, making money over making religion. Uh, Boston became the most powerful members of the colony, not Plymouth. Now, here's what a 17th century sailing ship looked like during that time. Now, by the mid-1600s, we also see that a lot of people in New England were worried that basically business interests were overtaking religious interests, that, you know, we were a colony started to be religious, not, not to make money necessarily, or not only to make money. Uh, many Bostonians weren't even full church members, which was shocking to some. Uh, and this, uh, this meant that um, if you wanted to become a full-on church member, you had to have public commitment, conversion, and testimonies, and they didn't always have that. In 1662, they actually decided, let's find a way to sort of let people get a foot in the door to the church, and they called this the halfway covenant that said you could baptize and sort of allow half membership into the Puritan faith, uh, even for people who had not proved their conversion. Uh, this was seen as a halfway measure as well, which uh, pleased not the stalwarts, nor did it please the people who were only halfway through the door. Uh, preachers used the pulpit to call for a recommitment to the church, which we'll see in a little bit known as the Great Awakening. 
Uh, they gave these very loud fire and brimstone, hell, you're all going to hell kind of speeches called Jeremiads, named after the book of Jeremiah, where he does a lot of that same sort of talk. And we will look at more colonies in chapter 3.